All right, we get it rolling on the Krug Show. Hope everybody's having a good day. It is April the 9th, 6.35 on the West Coast, 9.35 on the East Coast. Raj in the house from RSF 49ers. We're going to talk a little Niners. What's up, Raj? How are you, man? I'm good. I'm actually, I'm tired today. It's like my Monday. Tuesday's like my Monday, so I'm a little tired, but we're good. We're good. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the draft, man. I, it's getting kind of boring, 49ers on, so I, I need some 49ers news. There we go. There we go. Uh, and of course, we're brought to you by Pig and a Pickle, the best barbecue in all of Northern California. Check them out in Emeryville and Corte Madera. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. till 8 p.m. or until they run out. We're also brought to you by Sharp Corner Sports Cards and Collectibles, 205 Cypress Avenue in Pacific Grove. Call Anthony Catania at 831 521 5264. We're also brought to you by um, our good friends at Marin Auto Glass, MarinAutoGlass.com, 415-883-3030, and Underdog Fantasy. All right, tomorrow, um, Raphael 562 Niners says, like and subscribe, everyone. Yeah, absolutely, like and subscribe. Uh, Jimmy says, Larry, Raj, what's up? What's up, Jimmy? Good to see you. Uh, Raphael says, hey, what's up, everyone? Raj, Larry, everyone. Appreciate all you guys, people hanging out in the chat uh, as we get this thing revved up on a uh, on a Tuesday night, the night after the Final Four final finally ends. And tomorrow I'll be in Santa Clara for the local pro day. <clears throat> we really don't know who's going to be there because I don't know which of these ki- which of these guys is from the Bay Area and which of them are going to participate as far as high school. Stanford, I'm thinking of their pro class. Uh, I don't think of a lot of guys. Uh, San Jose State might have one or two. I know Cal's probably got one or two, but um, I don't, I'm not really sure who's going to be there. But then it came out this afternoon from our good friends, Matt Barrows, um, that Kellen Mond is going to be trying out during the Niners local pro day. What do you think of that news? Yeah, it was kind of interesting. I mean, if uh, you follow 49ers Twitter, Grant Cohn <laughs> a couple years back said this is the 49ers answer at quarterback, Kellen Mond. So, you know, he's probably excited about that news. But, I mean, Kellen Mond doesn't move the needle to me. But it's interesting that he's trying out because well, they got Josh Dobbs, right, a couple weeks ago. Uh, they still have Brandon Allen. They signed him to the, you know, they re-signed him. So they have their three quarterbacks. But they go and get Kellen Mond, make him the fourth quarterback, see if they can compete. But they still draft a quarterback in the draft. So it is a little interesting to see um, that they might have picked up, uh, you know, they have a tryout for Mon. So maybe he, emergency situation, they'll kick the tires on him. Maybe down the line, they could bring him in as a practice squad. We'll, we'll see. I thought that was interesting. Another guy that's supposed to be there, um, Terrell Owens' son, he's apparently supposed to be there. I think Matt Barrows reported that last week, too. So those are the two guys that stick out to me. Um, I don't know much about is it's Tariq Owens, right? Mm-hmm. Is that his yeah. name? Yeah. Um, is he a player? He's Terrell Owens' his son. He's got to have some speed. <laughs> <laughs> got to have something. Yeah. Um, Kellen Mond is interesting. He was a third round pick by the Vikings in the 2021 draft and then played 2021 with the Vikings, 2022 with the Browns, 2023 with the Colts. He he's never thrown an NFL touchdown. Um, He's, you know, I, I was an, you know, am an A&M fan. So I watched him in college. He was pretty good in college. Um, he's just a little mechanical, you know, he doesn't, he's not, he's not really fluid in anything that he does. Um, but he put up some good numbers at Texas A&M. It wasn't like he was a bum at Texas A&M. Um, he played in 46 college games, 50, uh, completed 59%, which is not great. 71 touchdowns, though, 27 interceptions, and also ran for 1,600 yards in his career with 22 rushing touchdowns. So I don't know. I mean, I kind of think of the Niners as done at quarterback. You've got Dobbs and Allen backing up Brock Purdy. So maybe what? Maybe some somebody's going to compete for a spot on the practice squad, maybe? Maybe a practice that, squad quarterback? That's what I was thinking, a practice squad or maybe – compete with Brandon Allen for that third spot. Although, I mean, Allen, he was there last year. You would think he's kind of a shoe in for that third spot, but with the 49ers history, you know, with quarterbacks, it's, it's, 
never a bad thing to at least evaluate quarterbacks and kick the tires on someone. Like I said, maybe they just keep them on the practice squad and have them ace in the hole. Who Maybe Brandon Allen gets hurt. I don't know. And then you need a third quarterback. So that's the way I look at it. Just someone for backup emergency. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, my God, Kellen Mond's going to resurrect his career with the 49ers. I don't think any of that. Um, like you said, he really hasn't panned out in the league in the NFL. Third round pick, I thought that was – that was pretty high. I thought, you know, okay, maybe he's going to get a shot to be the guy with the Vikings, and he just, just didn't have the tools. I remember seeing him. I think we played them in a preseason game a couple of years back, and Javon Kinlaw, he sacked him in the game, and I was like, okay, this guy's bad. <laughs> Kelvin Mott's not good. Well, the Vikings drafted him 66th overall, so that's yeah. pretty high. And then he appeared yeah. in one game as a rookie. He completed two of his three passes for five yards. And those were the only three offensive snaps of his NFL career outside of the preseason. The Browns claimed him off waivers ahead of the 2022 season. He spent last season on the Colts practice squad, and he's currently a free agent. Um, you know, I think he's probably smart to want to take a look at the Niners. I wonder if they will, you know, actually add him to, a, you know, to their camp roster and bring him in. As a, I mean, they're almost always going to bring four quarterbacks to camp. So I, you know, I could be happy with Kellen Mond as the fourth quarterback in camp this summer. I think that could make some sense, some sense, yeah. you know, as opposed to using a draft pick on a quarterback. Yeah. At least, at least, he, at least he's got some NFL game, ex, you know, experience a little bit here and there. He knows how a NFL room works, you know, locker room works. So yeah, over a late round draft pick, I guess he might be a better option. Although I mean, Brock Purdy was a seventh round pick. So at the end of the day, it's just a fourth quarterback. I don't think much of it, but it is interesting that they're actually giving him a tryout tomorrow. So we'll yeah, see how that I mean, ends. Somewhat high profile. Yeah. Um, Matt Mayoko has tweeted out, in addition to those invited to take part in the 49ers local pro day Wednesday, veteran tryouts are expected with Kellen Mond. Also tight ends, Curtis Hodges, who went to Arizona state Hunter camp Moyer, uh, who from uh, Oregon and Tommy Sweeney from Boston college. So, you know, the 49ers, Raj, I think you're definitely looking at that tight end spot. They yeah. they added Eric Sobert. What did you think of that uh, signing? I mean, uh, you know, they they tried to go for the Lions backup tight end, but the Lions decided to match. Um, and instead, they went with Eric Sobert. Do you think, you know, I think personally that, um, that you know, that Cam Latou is going to bounce back with a good camp. I, I really don't think Cam Latou is nearly as bad as the player that we saw last summer, and I expect him to bounce back. But it sounds like they're kind of looking to kind of stack their tight end uh, depth chart going into, going into uh, you know, at least going into the draft. Yeah, no, absolutely. They've been looking for a veteran tight end. I think they missed big when they couldn't get Brock right. I think that was a the guy they really wanted. You know, he has good – uh, receiver characteristics. I know he wasn't used a lot as a receiver, but he did have some good yak ability. Um, sober, I mean, I think they needed to get a veteran because they missed out on Brock Wright. So that was there. They needed a guy that can block. You know, they lost Charlie Warner. I think they really liked his blocking ability. So and they grabbed Sober. He's he's not a bad blocker. You know, he was um, in line with some of the top blocking tight ends, um, according to the analytics. So I think that's, you know, a need they needed. Uh, they did draft two young tight ends last year. They didn't pan out. Um, we'll see. I mean, there's going to be a lot of pressure on those two guys because they didn't re-sign Ross Dwelly um, either. So the 49ers definitely are looking to um, bolster that tight end department. You know, George Kittle's not getting any younger, Larry. He's getting closer to my age, which is never a good thing. So at the end of the day, you know, George Kittle, he needs some help out there. He can't continue to do everything on his own. So, yeah, you need some veteran tight ends. I still think they're going to draft one. It is not, like you said, you noted, Matt Mayoko said, there's going to be some tight end tryouts tomorrow. I wouldn't be surprised if they go and sign one of them um, afterwards uh, because it looks like they're still trying to get that extra depth. Again, Ross Dwelly's not back, so you need another veteran tight end if you're going to replace him. And you hope so, that those youngsters that you drafted last year pan out because Cam Latu, he was basically a redshirt year last year. And then was the other guy, Braden Willis? He didn't right. really look too hot, yeah. 
Sobert's 6'5", about 250. The Falcons drafted him in the fifth round in the 2017 draft. He's had a seven-year career. Falcons, Bears, Jags, Broncos, Cowboys, Texans. That's a lot of team, a lot of teams in a short amount of time. He appeared in 84 games, 16 starts. He's had 36 receptions, 292 yards, and two touchdowns. Last year, he appeared in 10 games, only one start with Dallas and Houston, and finished with three receptions for 12 yards. He's a you know, approaching 30, he's a 29-year-old native of Chicago, Illinois, went to Drake University. So we'll see. Um, you know, you know, if you if you were saying, would you rather the Niners go for a blocking tight end in the draft or more of a receiver? Because, you know, there are guys that could be intriguing receivers. I mean, as a Johnny Wilson from Florida State is kind of a pumped up wide receiver. Um, you know, he's kind of an interesting guy. If you wanted to have a flexed out wide receiver, kind of a body tip Ryman. I did the interview with Baldy the other day. He was saying that tip Ryman, according to the people he's talking to is the best blocking tight end in the draft. And he's projected to go in the fourth or fifth round. What do you think they, what do you think they're looking for more of a blocker or more of a receiver? I think more of a receiver. I mean, at the end of the day, you get sober. And like we said, he could probably block his, and you mentioned his stats there. He's not been used much as a pass catching tight end. So you get a guy that could block again, replacing Charlie Warner. Cause that was his role. I think Warner, I think sober, even though he didn't catch a lot, he still has more uh, receptions in his career. Although he's played a lot more years than Warner. Um, he has more, you know, uh, receptions and everything than Charlie Warner. So to me, that's that's a Charlie Warner replacement, a blocker. So if I'm the 49ers, I'm getting a really good pass-catching tight end. You know, again, Ross Dwelly was supposed to be that other pass-catching tight end. Just really never materialized over the last couple of years. And also, you got to realize this. Again, George Kittle is getting older. Maybe you get the heir apparent, a guy that George Kittle could mentor for a year or two. And then when Kittle's done, you have the new guy that could come in and, and take his role. So I think that's kind of where the 49ers are probably leading in. Um, in this tight end department. And you, again, hope and pray that the two guys you drafted last year can show some development. And if not, you kick them to the curb or you, you have them as backups, right? But I think the 49ers want a good pass catching tight end. They've been in the market for a tight end for years, even though they had George Kittle. You know, even a couple years back, Jordan Reed, they really wanted that two tight end set. And then he got hurt, you know, unfortunately, ACL. But I think they've been searching for another tight end to pair with George Kittle for the last couple of years. So I feel like that's the route they're going to go. You know, it's interesting. Chase Sr., who I stream with on Fridays, put out a, a tweet today. Four players the Niners could trade before or during the NFL draft. And he's got Brandon Ayuk. He says if a team offers a great trade package, um, you know, the Niners may may move Ayuk just simply because his asking price is too high. Or if he asks, he may have privately asked out. Uh, or if their relationship goes south. Then he's saying Talanoa Hafanga. Uh, the four Niners have been eyeing safeties and, you know, Hafanga, you know, it, 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 is he a strong safety backup to Jair Brown? Does, do they feel comfortable with one of those guys at free safety? Then he's got Drake Jackson, um, who, you know, is still only 22 years old. And then Ambry Thomas, what do you think of, of those four guys? Who do you think is most likely to get dealt during the draft? Maybe Talano Hufunga coming off the injury. I don't know if the 49ers really know what they have in them. And it's, it's not that they don't like them. I think they really love the guy. But they've kind of said, you know, they've been looking for a safety, but they are not sure if they're looking for a starting safety. And I think Hufunga kind of handcuffed him in, in a sense. It's not that he's not good or whatnot. It's you don't know how much he's going to be able to recover. So you're putting all your chips on, on Hufunga coming back from this injury 100%. And if he's not, you're really kind of – going to be searching for another tight end. They've been looking, they've been looking or not tight end, sorry, safety. They've been looking for safeties. You know, they didn't bring in Julian Blackman because Blackman obviously is a starter and they couldn't promise him to be a starter at safety. So I think that's the route. They've been really looking into the safety department. Um, I think that might be a guy because Brandon, I, I think they're going to figure it out. You, you can't get rid of Brock Purdy's top receiver, his number one guy, whether you think Brock Purdy's the top receiver than I like. That's a whole other argument between Debo and, and Brandon. I, they both do different things for this team. But the development of Brock Purdy, I feel, is tied with the development of Brandon. I, those two guys are such good, you know, uh, that's such a good duo. Their chemistry is so, uh, you know, tight-knit. 
And with Brock Purdy, you expect him to get better, but you want him to have his top target. You take him away, yeah, you could replace Brandon Ayuk, but Brock Purdy's going to have to re, you know, regain some chemistry with the new receiver. I think ultimately they'll figure it out. He's homegrown talent. The Niners always replace their, you know, they always pay for the most part their homegrown talented players, you know, Kittle, Debo, Bosa, Warner. But I, I think Talano Funga is the guy that makes sense to me just because they're not sure. And maybe you try to get some type of value and, and you got Jair Brown. You go and figure out a guy that could come in and replace Hufunga, hopefully. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how val- how much value the other guys are really gonna. I mean, yeah. Ambry, Drake. Yeah. Not I'm not even sure what Hufunga is gonna fetch. Yeah. I, I guess I, of this list, I would probably still go with Ayuk, just because I think that he's the one guy that would fetch quite a bit. Yeah. I don't know what to make of their of their statements about. Um, about Brandon Ayuk because of course they love him. Why wouldn't they love him? But this is going to come down to, you know, how he, it sounds like his camp wants to wait until some of these other wide receivers get signed. If we see, you know, Jefferson sign some outrageous contract here in the next few days, that could really take Ayuk's number, you know, up and out of, out of their range. I don't know. I'm not really sure what the, I'll say this. I don't love the idea of just trading Ayuk for nothing. I, I, I'd want to get multiple day one or day two picks. I mean, I'm not as tied to a first as other people. I could take a second and a third. The best trade that I saw for him was Ayuk to the commanders for Jahan Dotson, a second and a third. That one to me is marginally intriguing. I, I think most Niner fans don't want to trade Ayuk, but I mean, this is the issue. You know, nobody wants to. Tr- nobody wants to. Everybody wants to buy something. Nobody wants to pay the credit card bill. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You know. So it's like, <laughs> of course, they don't. Nobody wants to trade Ayuk because Ayuk's good. But can they afford Ayuk? You know. I mean, is is Ayuk going to be affordable? And um, if Ayuk's not afford, if, you know, if they don't move Ayuk, who? What other substantial? players off their roster are they going to move because their quarterbacks going from making a million to making 50 million probably within a year they probably need to prepare for that so that that's the thing it's like if you don't want to move Ayuk, i get it but tell me the the guy who makes lots and lots of money on the niner roster you do want to move yeah that that's true because at the end of the day you cannot afford to pay they had to move some guys this year you know armstead they they had to cut him and whatnot eventually everybody can get paid and you got to realize too you got next year you're going to have debo and Ayuk on two massive contracts if you resign or you give the extension to Ayuk, which he deserves it's gonna be tough you know to play the money game and, and again at some point you're gonna have to break up the band and i don't know i don't know what the future holds but i feel like maybe this team this niner squad that went to the super bowl has a good one or more two more years at max I mean, Trent Williams might be gone soon. You know, who knows how much, you know, George Kittle's got left in the tank, you know, and and Debo, you know, when he's up for another contract, are they going to keep him? Are they going to trade him? That might be a guy that they could look to trade. But I think you're right um, with what you said on your assessment is Brandon, you probably fetches the most trade value based on those guys. Based on those guys, you've said Emery and Drake Jackson. I don't think they're going to get anything for them. So it's tough to see. Um, you know, again, you don't know what the value is, but based on those guys, Ayuk has the most value. And if we remember 2019, they were in a dilemma. They were in a pickle, Larry, and they had to trade the guy with the more value. And DeForest Buckner was the higher trade value, so they got rid of him. So I don't think they're going to have that same situation. I think they want to avoid another default situation. But anything can happen. You never know. John Lynch does like to be active on um, draft days and trade. So we'll see. I don't think ultimately... BA will get traded. I don't think anybody's going to get traded. I think the Niners will move some draft picks here and there, but you never know, man. You know, the Niners did trade up to get Trey Lance a couple years back, and that was mind blowing. So you never know. Who who is the player? It's the you know today's April 9th. The draft, the first round of the draft is Thursday the twenty fifth. Yeah, we're get you know we're coming up on it. Who is the player today that you want the Niners to pick at twenty five? All right, thirty one on the. 25th. Honestly, I, I still don't. I, there's so it's. I I just want them to get the best right tackle or best. I just whoever the best tackle available is, Larry. That's what I want. But if there's a better player available, and we talked about this before, then if like the tackles available aren't, 
you know, a top tier tackle. And then I gotta I gotta see the best player available. Like if Chop Robinson's there, I want him to take him because he'd probably be the best player at 31. But it's tough, man. I I feel like maybe if Kool-Aid McKinstry's there, you take him because he's such a dynamic player. He's such a good cornerback. You can have him and, and Mooney Ward, and then you can move Demo in the slot because he's so versatile. And your secondary would be fantastic. So it, it's it's tough, you know. I the easy answer is oh yeah, you take the best right tackle. But if the best right tackle isn't even like a better player than whoever's on the board, I, you know, I don't know. I hope the Niners trade up. Honestly, I, I really do. I mean, they need help on the offensive line. Bad. I would they say do. get the best offensive lineman you can get. I'm big on yeah. Zach Frazier from West Virginia because he's got the wrestling background. He's got the 4.0 GPA. I think he could be a plug and play guy over Brendel week one. I was funny. I interviewed uh, um, Baldy on Friday night and <clears throat> the point that he made, that I thought was kind of interesting. He said, you don't have a great offensive line or you can't have a great offensive line unless you have a great center. Mm. And I thought that was interesting. And of course, this is a guy who's been in, you know, watched a lot of the Eagles and Jason Kelsey. And I knew that was what he had in mind. Um, I think Frazier's an amazing prospect. Now, I'd rather have Zach Frazier, who I think is the best center prospect and might be able to be a plug and play guy over Jake Brendel over Jordan Morgan or somebody who might be the seventh or the eighth, you know, offensive tackle. Um that's how I kind of look at it. I, I just think that bottom line with the Niners, they have to get a great player. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, you're drafting in the first round. You got to get a great player. And you have your need is on, you know, to me, your three top needs are O-line, D-line, and corner. Yeah. So whoever the great player is between an O-lineman, a D-lineman, and a corner, I think that's the route I would go. And and I'm convinced that Zach Frazier is, is a really great player. Um, yeah. You know, he's got the wrestling background. He's not just a wrestler. He was a championship wrestler. He's a 4.0 GPA. Um, you know, Baldy said that he's already talked to some personnel directors around the NFL that said that, you know, Frazier could start for them day one right now. Um I think Brendel is kind of the weak spot on that offensive line, to be completely honest, even though I like him. Um, he was a pro ball alternate two years ago, but I, I just think that that that's a little bit of fool's gold. I, I think he, you know, DJ reader kind of worked him in that mm-hmm. Bengals game. I would start with Zach Frazier and almost all the mock drafts I'm going with start with Zach Frazier. Uh, how, how do you feel about the possibility of going with a center at 31? Actually, I, I like it because you can build from the inside out. Like again, you you as long as you upgrade this O line, I think we're in a good you were in a good situation because you hit it right. I, I feel like Brendel was he thirty two journeyman. He kind of was this guy that they kept around the roster, and he finally got his chance to start. You know, he was a first time starter at thirty years old. So absolutely, if you can get a guy um, and become a perennial starter at center, I, I'm all for it. And then your O line is already substantially better from the inside, you know, and then you can figure out who's going to be an upgrade over, um, you know, Colt McKivitz on the outside, because you're right. If the tackle available at 31 is, is maybe 15th best, 16th best in the draft. Is he going to be immediately uh, going to be able to start? Is he going to be better than Colt McKivitz? It's hard to say. So you don't want to force yourself to take a position just because you feel like you need it. And then your O-line didn't get better. So if you can get a center, that's an upgrade and probably going to be your best player on the O line, other than Trent Williams and maybe Aaron Banks. I'm all for it. You upgrade, you upgrade a position, and you can get rid of Brendel, and this guy could be on your roster for years to come. So, absolutely, I think that's a fantastic um, decision. Um, another guy that we haven't talked about though on the O line, Aaron Banks. He's entering a contract season. That's we talked about Brandon Ayuk, right? Extending him and getting the money and everything. Aaron Banks is a guy that I don't think a lot of people are talking enough about. If he has a fantastic season, if he goes and has a Super Bowl season, Larry, or, or a Pro Bowl season, are they going to be able to afford him? I, I don't know. So you definitely, they need a draft, in my opinion, a very heavy offensive line focus draft because you potentially you have to replace Aaron Banks. Um, you know, Feliciano, what has he got? One more year. You hope Burford can develop and get better. Last year was kind of a, a fall off for him from his rookie season. Colt McKivitz, we know he needs to be upgraded. Like you said about Brendel, you know, he's, 
somebody that could be upgraded immediately. And then Trent Williams, he's the wild card. How many more years we got left with Trent? So O-line's a big focus for me. Yeah, I would say the over-under on the number of offensive linemen the Niners ought to draft is probably three and a half. I would probably yeah. go under. But, I mean, you got to go – you got to get three good offensive linemen here. I mean, you I mean, you really do. You need a center. You need a guard. You need a tackle. You may need Trent's replacement. Um, you know, and, and I don't know about any of their backups. You know, I mean, I think – you know, I mean, Jalen Moore, is he good enough? I don't know. Is Nick Zakel good enough? I don't know. Um, I don't know if any of their backups are really suitable. So I would say this is a three O line, uh, three offensive linemen draft, in my opinion. Now, Daniel Jeremiah has got a different idea. He came out with a mock draft today and he kind of likes Kool-Aid McKinstry. Mm. He went on a segment on NFL networks path to the draft and he was asked for the best team fit for Kool-Aid McKinstry. And he said, the Niners, he says, when you look at what he's done just over the last few weeks, he gets a chance to go out there during his pro day, show that he's healthy coming off that foot injury, and he really ran a fast time, faster than I expected. I know that, and that was one of the big question marks on him. So yeah, that you know the question was he had a fracture of his right foot, but he ran with a partial fracture at his pro day. They say that he's you know you know he didn't work out in Indy. Uh, he was going to work out at his pro day and did and then get the foot fixed. And they're saying it should be 100% before training camp. The Niners have had injury problems. Do you feel comfortable drafting a player who you know is having surgery between his pro day and training camp? I never like to draft players that have injury history, especially this close to you know the season and everything. I, I don't, because then it ends up being a redshirt thing, and I just Niners don't have good luck with that. I love Kool-Aid McKinster. I think he's a great player. I think he does fit the team. You know, there's been mixed reviews on him. I've seen the film. He's he's good. He's a good, talented cornerback. But I I just think, you know, the risk is there. And I don't know about that. If this team's trying to get a Super Bowl, you want to make sure everybody you get is going to be able to play and go through it because the rigors of an NFL season are tough on a normal rookie. And if you come in injured, like how, you know, how prepared are you going to be? Is your body going to be ready to hold up through the whole season? It's a grind, man. You're playing against the guys that are bigger, faster, stronger than you um, ever played up, you know, in college. You might have been the biggest guy, but you're not going to be the biggest guy um, in the NFL. And pro receivers are kind of a dog out there in the NFL. So I'm a little weary. I know he's really good. And if he falls, it's going to be tough to pass on him because he's he's damn good. And at 31, it's like he might be the best available player talent-wise. But you do have to really consider that injury. And do you want to gamble? To me, sometimes you draft those players with injuries. It's a little bit of a gamble. It's a little bit of a risk, but I mean, that's kind of reminds me of Jimmy Ward coming out of Northern Illinois where, you know, he had an injury um, and didn't he have a red shirt year that first year? He played, but he got a lot. He had a lot of injuries through his first two or three years. He had a lot of injuries, wrist, you know, hamstring injury. He had a broke, he had broke a couple bones that year. Um, He did play his rookie season, but um, it ended up being injured. He ended up getting injured that year. Um, what about the veteran route? You know, we have people suggesting Greg Newsom, um, you know, from the Browns could be available and he's a really nice corner. Would you trade a third round pick for Greg Newsom? The other one that got thrown out last week was Buda Baker and Buda Baker is just such a force. And I know the Niners have cap problems and this and that, but man, if you could make Buda Baker work, I think Buda Baker at free safety and Jair Brown or Hafanga at strong safety, would be a really nice safety tandem. I asked Baldy about it. He thinks that it would be a great fit for Buddha to mm-hmm. come to San Francisco. I don't think the draft pick compensation for Buddha is going to be very high. I don't either. I mean, I think either one of those guys you mentioned would be fantastic and they'd probably be a instant impact plug and play type guy better than any rookie you can get at that position, you know, at cornerback or safety. I, I would love either one of those guys. Money would have to be, you'd have to figure that out. But again, if you feel like this team, you still have a good year or two left with this core of this team that you can make a Super Bowl run, I'd go get a, I'd go get either one of those guys, especially you know um, to bolster that secondary, especially safety. Because again, Talano Hufung, he's such a wild card coming into the season. Like, w- what are we gonna get out of this guy? I, I love Talano Hufunga, but coming off a of torn ACL with the way he plays and his instincts, and he's got to be able to go sideline to sideline and laterally move. 
it's a tough one. So if we can get a Buda Baker, man, I'm all for it. But um, and I, I don't think he's going to get a lot of dra- – I think third-round pick would be – a lot for him. Fourth round pick. I mean, look at I, Stephon. I, I actually think it's going to be lower. I think it's going to be like a fifth or a sixth because of the money that he's owed and yeah. their situation on the cap. And the question is, can the Niners afford him? I mean, you, uh-huh. I know we know they can afford the fifth or sixth round pick, but can they get it? Can they fold his deal into their cap? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I'll tell you, he's the kind of guy that in a one year situation I would stretch for because, you know, the Eagles got Chauncey Gardner Johnson. Mm-hmm. And to me, you know, there was two real impact safeties that were going to be available this um, this offseason. C.J. Gardner-Johnson and Buda Baker. They got C.J. Gardner-Johnson. If the Niners got Buda Baker, in a lot of ways, I think that neutralizes the whole C.J. Gardner-Johnson, you know, addition. Yeah, I agree. I'll, I'll, I would love it. And I, for a, if it's just a one-year re- rental, um, that's a great year rental for Buda Baker. But you're right. It's, they got to figure it out. Um, contractually, money wise, it's got to make sense. But a fifth round pick for him, they can give that up in a heartbeat. Um, you know, look at look at Legarius Need. It's not like he got this huge, con, you know, draft pick compensation from the Chiefs. But again, the Chiefs knew nobody was going to be able to pay for him. The Titans were the only team that was going to be able to pay for him, so they got what they could. But the market's not too crazy when you when you trade for these, you know, veteran players. So. One of the articles that I think is interesting on Niners Nation is can the Niners afford to draft a player in the first round who needs time to develop? I mean, it depends how great of a player it is and what position, but um, I would say they want to make sure that they get some value on the field this year from their first round pick. Uh, I, You know, you're inside your Super Bowl window. Do you really want to draft a guy that's not going to play for three years? Even if you draft an offensive lineman, if you draft somebody at 31, I think that guy's got to be a plug-and-play guy. I think he's got to play. I agree. I, I I get it. They're a great team. They're a Super Bowl-caliber roster. But you don't want to waste the pick. I, I feel like in order to get to the Super Bowl and be able to win, you need a guy that's going to change, at least give you some type of impact that you didn't have last year. You need a guy that's going to make your team better you know, instantly. And, and that's why I think they need to get a, a home run hitter, a playmaker, a difference maker, whether it be on the offensive side of the ball, the offensive line, defensive, whatever side. Of, they just need a guy that could come in and start. I, I don't want them to get a guy that's going to sit around and take some time because you have a Super Bowl window. You don't know how long that's going to be. You don't want to waste it on a guy that you could have maybe drafted later. Oh, we got to develop him. I think first round, you have to hit on a guy that's going to give you instant impact. That's just the way I look at it. They haven't had a first round pick in a while, Larry. And they haven't always done good on first round picks. I feel like they, they kind of need to on this one. I, I feel like they need to. Um, couple interesting thoughts here. One, I want to share the screen and play this little thing from Dante Whitner. Whitner went on with Kay Adams, and here's what he had I to say. That, when we look at that, f- let's rewind that a little bit, and we'll we'll play a little a little Dante Whitner here. Here's right, Whitner talking good. about the officials in the Super Bowl. And when we think about the Super Bowl mm-hmm. as well, I think that the 49ers played against the refs as well, guys. I think that when we look at that film and you see bear hugs on most defensive ends, right? Wow. And you really see it in blatant moments in the game. <laughs> uh, the 49ers played against Taylor Swift, the refs, oh, and the Kansas City Chiefs. Dante. All three. <laughs> Dante, you really, <laughs> I don't think you were going to, that, that was not ready for that little, that little addition to that. Okay. That's, well, I'll let you say that. I'm not going to question that. Uh, you're, you're. All right. She's, she was completely overwhelmed by that. Um, you know, I'll say that. I mean, you know, Kay Adams, whatever. Um, but I, how can you not agree with Dante? I mean, I know it, it comes off, forget the Taylor Swift thing, but that comes across as sour grapes. And I know there's a lot of people who be like, oh, come on. But there was no question, you know, the, the, the chief offensive tackles, Donovan Smith and Jamal, as was it, uh, J- Jawan Taylor. Taylor had like seven more. Uh, seven more penalties than any offensive lineman in all of football and was seen bear hugging. I mean, we're not even talking about subtle holding. We're talking about obvious, blatant, and severe holding on um, 
on on Nick Bosa, and it went uncalled. So I don't know why it went uncalled. It, it was, is it? I don't. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. Um, I'm not saying maybe they're just crappy officials. <laughs> um, but it is amazing that you know that that was a theme going into the the um, the Super Bowl. I asked Nick Bosa myself about it. I said, what, when you watch these tackles on film, what do you see? And he's like, they hold a lot. Mm -hmm. He literally said they hold a lot. And then we, we have, you know, multiple bear hugs in the Super Bowl, and yet no penalties were called. It's a bad look for the NFL. I think what yeah, what'd no. you think watching it? I mean, obviously the Super Bowl is long and gone and we can't sit here and, and cry about it. I'm over sure. it, but that was what a lot of people said. If you watch the game and they asked Dante the question and said what he said, I agree with him hundred percent. I mean, we can't change it, but you guys watch the game. You've seen the film. You, like you said with Bosa and he said what he said, they hold a lot. I think Dante Winter, he, Dante Whitner said what a lot of people have wanted to say. Somebody finally said it in the local media. And I, I think that was a hundred percent accurate. So uh, kudos to Dante. Kudos to saying that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Let him, you, you know, I like guys who, you know, you ask me, you know, you ask him a question, they give you an answer. He he yeah. tells you where he's coming from. And I know there'll be, there's people out there that would say, you know, oh, it's sour grapes, but screw yeah. them. Um, it was pretty obvious that those calls went against the Niners. Now, was that going to change the game? It may have. It may have. Um, it's a tough one for Niner fans. They've gone, you know, five and zero in super bowls. And now they've gone zero and three in super bowls and the, the Ravens game. There were some bad calls and this game, there were some bad calls and it's just, it's it, it, it comes across as sour grapes, but you kind of wonder, you, you know, if, wonder. if with Jacoby Jones, with, if, if you you know, that was a blatant double hold on Bruce Miller, hmm. you know, if that alone, if you just take that one, Bad, blatant um, miss call away in the Ravens Super Bowl. That put a touchdown on the board. That changed the game. It changed yeah. the dynamic of the game. Yeah. So I, I'd love to say ah, none of these things would have mattered, but I, I can't say that. I, I mean, they make a difference. And I think, speaking of the Chiefs specifically, I remember seeing a stat after the Super Bowl. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they said over the three Super Bowl wins they have, they have zero holding calls on them. I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but I, maybe the chat will in know. In their but, wins, in the loss to Tampa, they had a few probably. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think that during those wins they've had under the Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid era, they have never been called for a hold. That's, that's actually crazy. One of my favorite players in the draft is Blake Corum. Mm -hmm. And I realize the Niners have a loaded running back room. He's so good. But when you look at this, I see Emmett Smith. Mm -hmm. Emmett Smith's a Hall of Famer. If I'm right, and Blake Corum is a Hall of Fame running back, would you take Blake Corum? If I if I could guarantee you this guy's a Hall of Fame running back, the Niners have Elijah Mitchell. He didn't play. They have J.P. Mason this year. He didn't play. Now, this guy's way better than those guys. Um, I love Christian McCaffrey, but Christian McCaffrey, especially if you're moving off of your receivers in the next couple of years, could be used as a, as a flexed-out receiver. Um, I'm not convinced that he wouldn't be really good at it. What do you think? If if you could get a draft pick and turn it into Blake Corum, and Blake Corum was going to be a great player, could the Niners draft a great running back? Or I've seen people on on uh, Twitter with you know emojis or not emojis, but like video of them beating somebody and be like, this is what I would do to Kyle Shanahan. If he drafts another third round running back, I get <laughs> it. I get it. If you draft a, sh a shitty running back, <laughs> yeah. um, then that's not good. But what if I'm right? And Blake Corum is the next Emmett Smith and he's truly a hall of fame running back. Would you have interest in Blake Corum? Absolutely. I love Blake Corum. I'm a Michigan. I love Michigan football. I've watched them over the years. I, I was at a Michigan game a couple years back when they beat Ohio State for the first time in a decade, and I saw Blake Corm run wild. I've seen him at the Rose Bowl last year. I love Blake Corm. With 49ers, come go get Blake Corm. The next day, they're calling up Elijah Mitchell and saying, hey, buddy, you're gone. Cut you. I, I love Elijah. Or trade him. The, or tra he doesn't have trade value. Maybe, what do you get? Seventh maybe round a seventh-round pick. Yeah. I'm taking Blake Corm because guess what? 
when CMC is done in two years or three, whatever, you pass the torch to Blake Corum. And, and you can have Blake Corum and Chris McCaffrey. I, I know people would go crazy if they draft another running back. That's if they draft another Trey Sermon. If you draft Blake Corman, you can guarantee that he's going to be a Hall of Fame running back, Larry. I'm taking Blake Corum, and I could have CMC, Blake Corum all day, every day. You lessen the load on CMC. You lessen the load on Blake. Let him learn the intricate intricacies of NFL offense, the Kyle Shanahan offense. Kyle Shanahan and a run game. A guy like Blake Corum would be fantastic. I would love it. And then you still have J.P. Mason. So I think it'd be a dub for the 49ers. Um, now I know people are going to get mad if they draft another running back, but a running back at the caliber of Blake Corum for the 49ers to be the successor of CMC, I think it's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, let's have a realistic five minute discussion here on Brock Purdy and winning the Super Bowl. The Niners have Brock Purdy. Mm -hmm. He is their quarterback. Right. If you, if Shanahan and Lynch came to you and said, Raj, we want to win the Super Bowl with Brock Purdy. How do we do it? If they came to me and asked me that question, I'd be like, dude, build a fortress around him with your offensive line and get another big time running back. Mm. Run the ball, run the ball behind a, you know, run the ball more and have a better offensive line uh, in front of them. If you do, if you had another great running back and, you know, two or three really good offensive linemen added to this mix, to me, that's how you do it. Yeah. That's how you're going to win a Super Bowl with Brock Purdy. Um, you're going to run the heck out of it, and you're going to build a line in front of him. Absolutely. And you're going to play action out of it. I mean, look at him off the play action. He's amazing. Yeah, and you, you still got a Debo. You still got Kittle. You still got Ayuk, so you still have your top weapon, Juwan Jennings. Play action the hell out of it. Like you said, offensive line. What have we been screaming about over the last two years? Build an O-line. You build a line. You get better at running. Nobody's going to stop this team. When the 49ers finally got a running back like Christian McCaffrey on this roster, it changed the game. Like, they were good with late-round draft picks, you know, uh, Matt Breida, you know, undrafted guys. When they finally got a top-tier running back, it, it changed the complexion. So you add another guy, I mean, it just naturally would get better. So, yeah, 100%. I would love to see um, them get a guy. If they can get Blake Corum and improve this offensive line, they – March right back to the Super Bowl there. 100%. Yeah, no, I, I, I really think it's, you know, we're talking about receivers and this and defense. I mean, they need to have a complete football team, yeah. but um, they've got a pretty nice defense. I, I, I would love to add a little, you know, maybe one piece on every level, maybe one yeah. corner, one safety, one linebacker, one D end, one D tackle. I mean, I'd like to use some day three picks and replenish the D a little bit. But to me, the goal of this of this uh, you know this draft should be let's reinvent what the offense looks like around Brock Purdy. Let's stop trying to protect Brock Purdy with street free agents and <laughs> and you know guys signed off the street and date. You know, let's get some a real investment of real talent in front of him. And if you can find one more dynamic weapon whether it be a tight end, a wide receiver. In this case, I'm talking about a running back. Um, I would do it. I would do it and and be more of a run-heavy team and play action pass. I believe Brock Purdy's completion percentage off play action is like 84%. It's it's crazy. And, and at the end of the day, Larry, if he's your franchise, if you're going to be giving him the keys to this Jeep and paying him all this money next year, you know, that everybody's expecting him to get this crazy contract. If he has another Pro Bowl caliber season, you're paying him a lot of money. So it makes sense to load up your team around him, build around him. It's like any other team. They get a franchise quarterback. What do they do? They build an O-line. They get weapons. It's, it's, it's a natural thing. So if he is your franchise quarterback, you need to make sure that this team is stacked in front of him for many years to come because he's going to be your guy to carry your franchise for years to come. So, yeah, it makes sense. All right. Let's hit now. Five. Yeah. What's that? I said stack it now so you don't have to worry about getting a thin team around you. Like, oh, my God. Now we need this. Now we need this. Stack it now. You got all these draft picks. You still got a window. Stack it as good as you can. Well, and also, you know, when you are a run first play action pass football team, you better have a runner. Mm -hmm. If, you know, I mean, how many years in a row can, I mean, what did CMC have for touches? Wasn't he on pace for 400? It Didn't was he crazy. get, was it, was it over 400 or just under 400? He had a Close. ton of touches. Yeah. 
Um, I to me, in, in, you know, if CMC went down and the Niners had to lean on Elijah Mitchell and JP Mason, are they a Super Bowl team? I would say they're not. No. Look at Detroit. They had David Montgomery and um, Gibbs. Jameer Gibbs. And look at that combo. Look what it did. Um, and I just, to me, if I could, if I could get a, a, a McCaffrey quorum combo, man, I'd feel really good about their chances. Nah, All right, let's true. hit some supers and then we'll jump. We'll jump. Uh, Lorenzo Gonzalez is elite. Who cares? LOL is Purdy our franchise quarterback. No doubt. If he's not, who is? It's not Dobbs? Kellen Mond. <laughs> it's not Kellen Mond. <laughs> Trey Lance is not walking through that door. Josh Dobbs is though. You see him at the Josh Dobbs. yesterday. What's that? He was watching. He was in Cleveland at the NASA Research Center, totally doing the. He was watching the eclipse. He did like all this NASA content. I'm like, this guy really is a freaking astronaut. It's kind of crazy, but back the up astronaut. The I mean, the, past- the guy's really, really smart. He is. Um, I, I, you know, if if the Niners are getting the Dobbs that they played against at Levi's last year, I love it. Mm-hmm. Love it. I, I think he's comparable to Darnold. Right. I, I, I mean, he, he might be a little bit, he's smarter. He's more athletic. Yeah. Probably, you know, I would say they're, you know, I'm not saying that Dobbs is head and shoulders better, but he's comparable to Darnold. Right. I think, I think so. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't mind their quarterback depth chart. 49er underscore throwback says, so are the 49ers looking to replace George Kittle? No, but George Kittle's 30 and, they they absolutely they lost their second tight end, a blocking tight end. I think they're looking for somebody who, I mean, once again, as I'm just saying, if if you're trying to build a Super Bowl winner around Brock Purdy, how do you want to win? You want to run the hell out of the ball. So that yeah. means upgrade your offensive line. Uh, Tip Ryman is supposedly the best blocking tight end in the draft. He's probably like a fifth round pick out of Illinois. Go draft Ooh. him. Okay. Draft him. Have a dominating inline blocker. You go um, let Kittle eat. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and also stop leaning so heavily on Kittle. We've got uh, this one from Daryl Granville. He says, LK, we have to get Mason Pline into camp. Uh, the, the tackle from North Dakota. Yeah, Garrett Greenfield. I think you're talking about yeah. South Dakota. Uh, or, or no, he's talking about Frank Crum, probably. The, the ginger. From North Dakota. Okay, Mason Klein is a great uh, receiving prospect. He's a basketball player who's 6'8. He's got above the rim jumping, run and jump abilities, a really oh. good athlete. And he is a mechanical engineering major. He's super smart. He's oh, got 10 inch hands. Yeah. So Mason Klein, in my mind, if you could go day three of the draft and go, uh, you know, Tip Ryman and Mason Klein, um, that might, you know, it's of course you're drafting again more rece- more tight ends. You double drafted the position last year. You'll be a double draft of it this year. But oh, whatever, man. it's an important position. It really is for the, for the 49ers. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 49er underscore throwback. Tough question for you guys. Who do you pay, Demo Lenore or Mooney? Wow. What do you think? I like I'd probably Demo, pay man. Lenore. I'm pretty paying Lenore. He's a little bit more versatile. Good young player. He's been. Just playing his ass off the last two years. I love Mooney Ward. That's my guy, but he's getting older. Um, he'll command more money. I think you could pay Lenore a little bit less, and I think he'll give you a little bit more. Um, I like Lenore. If I had to choose between them, I'd take Lenore, but, man, I, I want them both. I hope the 49 I want them both, both, yeah. I mean, you need them both. You need them yeah. both. Look at the way um, Kansas City beat the Niners. They had McDuffie and Sneed. Yeah. Um, the Niners need, you know, all the good corners they can get. Absolutely. Um, and this last one from Nolo U. I'm not sure where the comma is supposed to be here. It says, good team stop the run, Larry. Pass first or bust. Yeah. Where's the good comma? Good team stop go? the run, Larry. Comma. Pass first. You got to pass first. or but he's, So he's saying the league is becoming a pass first league. It's become a passing league. Yeah. Yeah. I, but, I agree with that. But Kyle but, Shanahan, he, he's, atyp- he's still going to build his team around the run. That's, that's Kyle. Good teams. Stop the run. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
I hear you. So in, uh, what he's saying is don't go for Blake Corum because good teams will be able to stop your run and you got to pass first in this league to win. Yeah. Um, I think, I, you know, I think if we had Kyle sitting right here, you know what he would say to us? We need offensive balance. Mm. That's what he would say. Would we say. need offensive balance. That means you got to pass it and you got to be able to run it. I think that's, um, that's a fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think that's probably true as well. I mean, you do need offensive balance and he always tries to maintain, you know, offensive balance for sure. Raj, what do you got cooking the rest of the week? How's your week looking? Uh, just a lot of work, man. Um, uh, hopefully things get better. You know, uh, once, once, once the draft comes, I'll be ramping up for, you know, all the content stuff, but just been staying busy with work, you know, um, just grinding, working, picking up extra patience here and there and, um, you know, doing the thing. But yeah, if there's big news, we'll definitely be live and we'll talk about it and all that, but I've um, just been working a lot. So, well, man, Boring. we appreciate you. We appreciate everybody in the chat and thanks to our sponsors, pig and a pickle, uh, Marin auto glass, underdog fantasy. And of course our brand new sponsor, sharp corner sports cards and collectibles. Thanks to Anthony Catania. Uh, as well, 831-521-5264. Raj, have a great night. You get Warriors, Lakers on the tube. Giants losing yeah. to the Nationals already 2-1. Are you more of a Warrior guy or more of an – I know you went to the Warrior game last week. Are you more – like, if you hang this up, are you going to go Warriors, Lakers, or are you going uh, uh, Jung Hu Lee and Giants, Nationals? I'm, I'm going Warriors game. I'm, I'm a Warriors fan after the Niners basketball. I just – you know what? I used to play baseball. I used to love baseball, but I'm not a baseball not guy. Not so much anymore. I, I, if I want, if I watch the baseball game, Larry, I'll be asleep, and I, <laughs> I got some work still left to do. So I'm going to watch the Lakers, Warriors. Hopefully, Steph Curry drops another forty and uh, can take down the Lakers. Go Warriors. Go uh, Go Giants. Hopefully, they both get a win tonight. Raj, great stuff, man. We'll see you next week. Appreciate you, man. Take care. Thanks to everybody. Peace. Yeah, never met a man I've been scared of.